you've been working for, for some time on a book about Ed Logue, who's one of the remarkable builders that emerged in, in post-war urban America. Uh, what drew you to his story? I'm using Ed Logue as a way to look at the, the changes that took place over the second half of the 20th century um, in the approaches that, that city builders like Ed Logue used. And we can see as we look at his career, as he moved from New Haven to Boston to New, New York, York State, uh, and then on to the South Bronx, which was his last major job, um, that there's an evolution in the approaches that he takes and that he learns from mistakes. He still continues to make them, but uh, there are really important shifts in the way urban renewal plays out. Right. So can you set the stage for us for New Haven in the late in the late 40s, right? So this is a this is a city that does have this sort of highly fixed and highly educated core in Yale University, but it's also a former industrial powerhouse that is collapsing a, in terms of its It's been business. dying for decades. Right. Uh, it's in very bad shape, and yet it uh, it is still attracting poor populations. Um, a lot of African Americans coming from the South looking for opportunity just at the time that many of these factories are collapsing. Uh, and so there was a, a real a effort to, tr to try to figure out how to reinvent this city. And they're going to do it by being very shrewd about taking advantage of these federal dollars that exist through the National Housing Act and uh, urban renewal. And mm -hmm. so the project that he, for the rest of his career, will look back on as formative for him is a project in a neighbor, an Italian neighborhood called Worcester Square, mm -hmm. where they innovated rehabilitation of house, existing housing rather than just clearing it and starting all over and again. And that presumably kept the residents in place? Yes, it kept on? residents. And also, the other thing that mattered to Logue throughout his career and that he really takes, really takes shape within the New Haven period is a commitment to creating socioeconomically and racially mixed communities. Mm -hmm. So this does get him into trouble in certain ways because it does lead to some dislocations throughout his career, but it's his strategy in the ideal is to create neighborhoods that have both working class people and middle class people. But they make mistakes. For example, the income from uh, sales mm -hmm. of in stores is crucial to the city's survival. They mm -hmm. also want to keep people shopping downtown. Their hope is that people who live in suburbs will come downtown. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they replicate the shopping mall approach in downtown New Haven. What they do is they really deprive the city of what makes the city unique, right. the, the, the street life. Uh, it all it becomes an automobile oriented environment. Uh, so in trying to solve the city's problems with suburban solutions, they ultimately undermine what made cities distinctive. And in 1960, he gets an offer from the newly elected mayor of Boston, John Collins, to come and try to solve the problems of Boston, another dying mm -hmm. city, mm -hmm. a richer a city, city, a yeah. bigger city. Um, with a wealthy elite, uh, uh, just a much larger scale. So, you know, Lowell comes in and um, he inherits a city. He, he he's very tough in his demands. He says, okay, I will head something called the Boston Redevelopment Authority, which had been just a little thing that he insisted had to be much more powerful. So Logue had promised when he came into Boston that he would never do for Boston what had happened before he got there, which was the destruction of the West End neighborhood. Mm -hmm. The one exception, in a sense, was Government Center, but it was being built on a site that they thought nobody would care about in that it was very much the uh, red light district right. of, of Boston. And so there was a fair amount of clearance. But I think what's so important about government center as a strategy for trying to reinvigorate Boston and its economy was the notion that government at all levels, the city, the county, the state, the federal government, would provide that, economic, that leverage to get the downtown mm -hmm. economy going again. It was viewed as 
a rather shocking building. Mm -hmm. There is a beauty to that neo-brutalist uh, yeah. thing. It's, uh, I think the biggest mistake was probably the plaza. Right. Uh, and that they were, the architects um, were looking towards creating grand public space like Siena right. uh, or like Venice. And this is a different climate. It's also, uh, it just didn't work in that hard surface. Now, of course, if you, s you sit on s the seventh floor of, of Government Center and you look down towards the water, you see the other thing that is really the, the positive legacy of Logue in Boston, right? You see Faneuil Hall, you see the redevelopment of the, of the waterfront. It was a, a market space that was completely deteriorated in terrible shape. A lot of it, had, some of it had moved out, some of it hadn't. Um, and they decided that they wanted to save it. Um, and they, again, the idea was if we can k make retail more viable downtown, we'll bring people downtown. Um, but they didn't make the mistake that they made in New Haven. It is amazing, right, when you go there. It's not that, like the shops are any different from the suburban shopping mall shops. Often they're exactly the same. But because they're in 18th century buildings and because they have this feeling of openness to the waterfront, it just is a totally different experience. Well, that's a far more a, exciting one, that's right? a very, it, that change to the chain stores is really more recent decades. Right. So the fall of 67, he's trying to sort of put his life together, and his assistant says, the governor's on the phone. He says, what governor? <laughs> Nelson Rockefeller, the governor of New York. And here comes this offer to be the president of this newly created agency, the Urban Development Corporation, and use a different combination of financial support, private money, state money, and federal dollars. New York was in big trouble and had a tremendous housing crisis. So, you know, by the time things settled down, the UDC was building an awful lot of housing uh, in New York, including its, you know, the, the sort of uh, prize project, which was the development of Roosevelt Island. He saw it as a place where there would be subsidized housing, there'd be market rate housing, there'd be middle class housing that'd be subsidized at a somewhat lesser level than mm -hmm. for, for lower middle class and, and lower class people. So he really wanted it to be a very unique place. And then he got involved doing smaller scale things, right? Yeah, in the I South mean, Bronx. He is hired to be the president of something called the South Bronx Development Organization, um, which is very much a uh, a, a, an organization that's very locally based in the South Bronx. He partners with a CDC called the Mid, the Mid Bronx Desperados, <laughs> and he does things that are very different from what he's done before. Rather than build, you know, big projects like Roosevelt Island um, and many of the other things he did with star architects like Boston City Hall, like the architects who built on Roosevelt Island and all over New York State. He takes a very different approach. First of all, there aren't the dollars to mm -hmm. do those kinds of things. But it's also a period when the only real money is in solutions that are dependent on the private market. And so he develops a project called Charlotte Gardens, which is basically putting mass-produced, prefabricated, suburban-style houses in the middle of the burned-out blocks of the South Bronx. It's also they sort of a downsizing of the neighborhood, right? You're going from much higher density levels to lower density levels. Which many people criticized as inappropriate, but it's he was trying was to then, get the, the, uh, homeowners yeah. in there. They were, they were uh, policemen, firemen, um, people who needed teachers, people who needed and wanted to live in New York. They didn't want to live in the suburbs, mm -hmm. but they did want to own a home. Right. Um, and it was interesting that, that so the, in the Mid Bronx Desperados did this, the vetting of applicants. I mean, they, they opened it up and their people were lined up, you know, mm -hmm. long lines, people putting in applications. People wanted these opportunities. And they also loved these suburban style houses. 